Private equity and venture capital professional associations. There's plenty of them, but are they really worth joining? And what do they really offer? Coming up. I'd like to tell you the story about a professional association in private equity, which I founded and see what lessons we might be able to learn from it. So I was managing a fund for Soros Fund Management. It was a $200 million regional private equity fund for Southeast Europe. And I was based at the time in Serbia. And at the time, there were about two or three funds operating in Serbia, but not a very strong ecosystem. And myself and a couple of other fund managers, as well as some bankers and accountants and lawyers, decided that we were keen about private equity and that we would found an association. So. Um, about 20 years ago, we, we went to a hotel, uh, we sat down in a conference room, had a few drinks, and that became the kind of founding meeting of the Serbian Private Equity Association, which had about 10 founding members, a mixture of fund managers and uh, service providers. And there was a lot of enthusiasm at the beginning. And so what we did is we had made a program of events, we, we started modestly, we had a few cocktails, We we tried to do a few lectures and seminars and the like. And I became the first president and we had a kind of committee, uh, executive committee managing the, the fund. Obviously, in this case, being a small group, we all had our day jobs. And so we would do it on, on the side. And this went on for several years and we, we would manage to do a drinks a couple of times a year and one or two events. And we charged a very small fee because we weren't really providing uh, very much. Then a few years later, I, I left and I was replaced by an, another, another person as the president who carried on for several more years. But eventually, after a few more years, uh, the coal thing fizzled out. It kind of, it kind of uh, slowed down very much. And this was due to maybe the fact that the private equity uh, ecosystem in Serbia didn't really take off on the PE side, although there's been quite a bit on the incubator side. And having something managed by a committee or a group of people, it's very hard sometimes to get that motivation going, especially when people have other day jobs. And we obviously had no resources, we had no office, we had no full-time staff, so everything's done on a voluntary basis. And eventually, over time, it took the route of kind of fizzling. And it's a typical story you might find or uh, in other places in the world. So let's see what we, lessons we can draw from that. So thinking about what types of private equity associations are, are, are out there in the world, I think you can divide it into several categories. And I'm going to show you a few logos on the screen as, as we talk through this. Um, you've got the kind of um, regional, uh, the regional or, or global associations. So examples of this would be the International Limited Partners Association, which is a, a bit special because it's only open to LPs. You've got IPEV, International Private Equity Valuation Association, which is also unusual in the sense it doesn't really have members. It's, it's a kind of association uh, there to publish standards pretty much, but doesn't do anything else. And then we've got genuine private equity associations for GPs as well, such as the Emerging Markets Private Equity Association, which covers emerging markets, Invest Europe, which uh, is uh, Brussels based and covers uh, European countries. And, or another example might be the African Venture Capital Association, which is a pan-African. So that's one type of professional association. The second type would be national associations, of which there are many. And I'm going to be, I, I looked up a few, I'm going to be talking about a few of them. So the, the main ones would be the, um, the US, where we've got two. There's the American Investment Council and the National Venture Capital Association. You've got um, the UK British Venture Capital Association, and you've got also national associations in Canada, France, Germany, Italy, Switzerland, Austria, and other countries. The third type is, is an asset class type. So you'll have associations, for example, of impact investors or mezzanine, but they remain still a very small minority. And, and the, the broad associations are pretty much centered on national associations, or regional associations. I'd like to look at what are the, some of the management profiles of the associations because um, one of the ways that can help you to understand their success, the way they work, what they can really offer is to look at their management structure. So I would divide it probably into about four, four broad categories. The first one would be a kind of a proper major organization. The examples of this would be EMPA, 
Emerging Markets Private Equity Association or Invest Europe. In this case, these are proper organisations. They have a substantial office, so not, not a shared office or a post box. They have several staff, you know, six, ten people, full-time paid staff, looking at conferences, research and other activities. So they're proper organisations. Uh, and these are quite sustainable and they have a depth of resources which allow them to get involved in publishing uh, lots of research, lots of papers, coordinating efforts, lobbying, organising events in a systematic way. So you've got the proper organisations. Then you've got, I suppose, what you could describe as the stable groups, where you would have an office, which could be a small office or sharing one of the members' offices, and maybe one person full-time, perhaps two max. And these are groups which we could consider stable in the sense that they will keep going for a while. And examples of that might be someone like the Luxembourg Private Equity Association, the Austrian one, um, some of the other national ones. The British one is probably more towards a, a proper organisation. Uh, but these are stable entities and they will, they will obviously offer somewhat less, but they are, they, are, they are something that's sustainable. Then you've got uh, the kind of one-man bands. So these are organisations which are really driven by the enthusiasm of one individual. But obviously that individual, there's got to be some, something in it for them in the sense that they need to be sufficiently motivated to do it. And sometimes this could be because that individual, uh, it's their main activity. They may be a service provider and a big part of their livelihood will derive from their position as the leader of uh, one of these professional associations. So on the plus side, it's quite good because you, you have the energy and drive of one individual rather than the disadvantages of management by committee. But on the other hand, you know, it, uh, the, the association is also very much linked to the individual's personality. But on the whole, that's a good thing because it does also make the organisation more sustainable. An example of that might be something like the Croatian Venture Capital Association and a couple of the other um, smaller emerging markets professional associations. Then you've got the fourth type, which is the kind of, I'll describe as a stop-start type. So you've got a group of people who get together, they form an association, then they don't really follow up. Um, everyone's got a day job, but they kind of divide the tasks in an uncoordinated fashion do a couple of events, then nothing happens for a while. And these are kind of stop-go type associations. They'll do a website, but then nobody maintains it. So the stop-start ones are, 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 are less sustainable, um, but a lot of them are like that. Um, I would probably describe the one I was involved in, SPEA, as a, a bit of a stop-start association. And the problem with those is they may not be sustainable over the, over the longer term. So broadly, those are the four categories. The proper organisation, the stable group, the one-man band, and the stop-start. Let's consider who the members of these professional associations are. So the, the broad categories would be normally um, LPs, GPs, service providers and individuals. Those are the broad categories and often, often the membership structure reflects those broad categories. And so what are the motives and, and what do these people hope to get out of it? Well, LPs, uh, generally their mission is to try and support the industry um, and uh, to be good corporate citizens. For GPs, it's often a forum for them to interact with other GPs and also broadly to support the industry. For service providers, it's a mix of, of being in, interested in the ecosystem but looking to sell their services. So they have an ulterior motive. And for individuals, it might be, for example, uh, ex-GPs who are retired or, or some other or a non-executive director who works with um, GPs or, or an operating partner, and they will be also involved in the ecosystem and so these four categories are all uh, what you'll find in the membership and it's quite typical that most of the PFP uh, associations will have slightly different categories for these four different uh, subgroups to reflect also their differing motivations and one of the things to look for in a, an association is how many GPs are really driving the organization and whether the organization is mostly driven by service providers in which case in my opinion it does lose something if that is the case we should also look at the economics of private equity associations. Uh, and here on screen, I'm going to put up some, some details about that in a minute. But the economics are broadly that the, um, the associations will drive their main revenues from membership subscriptions, uh, possibly also from uh, a share of training courses they may offer and some sponsorships. And their main overheads would typically be full-time staff and offices if they have such and service providers to the association, maybe for a training course or a caterer, for example. So they're fairly simple 
businesses as such. And um, I did a little bit of research and uh, I was very curious to see what the cost of the association was and how it compared across different associations. And I, uh, and on screen you can see the annual fee. So this is an annual fee for a GP who is managing 200 million euros assets under management for one year because there'll often be different rates for a longer subscription or for more assets or less assets under management. And so you can see the kind of a scorecard here. It's kind of an interesting uh, fragmentation. So at the top, you've got the African Venture Capital Association, which is a 14,000 euro annual fee. And at the bottom, you've got uh, the Serbian Private Equity Association, which I was president with 400 a year, the Croatian with 650 a year, and then various others. I could point to Invest Europe at 5,000 a year, EMP at 4,000, ILP at 3,000, and various others. And so the, um, the pricing is really all over the place. And it makes you think that um, some of the, you've got to wonder about some of the highly priced ones, whether they really are going to give you, you know, the value for that money. And for the smaller ones, you know, obviously they may, they may offer somewhat less, but the pricing is really all over the place. And I thought it'd be interesting for my viewers to actually uh, look at this, because I don't think anyone's actually made a study or a comparison of private equity associations price and value for money. And obviously one of the issues you might come across is that if you're a, a GP or an LP and you're a regional LP, you know, and you're working, for example, in France, Germany and, and the UK, should you join all three associations on a national basis or should you just join Invest Europe? And sometimes I've had complaints by LPs and GPs saying, well, we don't want to have to join five associations. Maybe we'll just join Invest Europe and not bother with the national ones or we'll join IL EMPA and not bother with any of the local ones. So that's always a bit of a dilemma because, um, you know, if you join four or five associations, you're going to have to pay um, four or five sets of fees. And is that really worth the money? So what about private associations in conclusion? Well, it's, it's a, I would say it's a mixed picture, uh, a very mixed bag of services and, and resources at the disposal of the associations, no real coherence in the pricing. Uh, and so I think for anybody who's a GP or an LP, you have to really look at each association per region, per, per, per asset class, per what they offer, and make your own decisions because clearly there's a lot of variance uh, and uh, it might be useful in, in my view to have some kind of body coordinating standards among professional equity associations which is not the case at the moment.